Section 11 of The Captain of the Pole Star and Other Tales by Arthur Conan Doyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Man from Archangel, Part 2. Now that I had done this thing, a reaction set in upon me. I felt that my burden lived, for I heard the faint beat of her heart as I pressed my ear against her side in carrying her. Knowing this, I threw her down beside the fire which Madge had lit with as little sympathy as though she had been a bundle of faggots. I never glanced at her to see if she were fair or not. For many years I had cared little for the face of a woman. As I lay in my hammock upstairs, however, I heard the old woman as she chaffed the warmth back into her, crooning a chorus of, Ah, the poor lassie, ah, the bonny lassie, from which I gathered that this piece of jetsam was both young and comely. The morning after, the gale was peaceful and sunny. As I walked along the long sweep of sand, I could hear the panting of the sea. It was heaving and swirling about the reef, but along the shore it rippled in gently enough. There was no sign of the schooner, nor was there any wreckage upon the beach, which did not surprise me, as I knew there was a great undertow in those waters. A couple of broad-winged gulls were hovering and skimming over the scene of the shipwreck, as though many strange things were visible to them beneath the waves. At times I could hear their raucous voices as they spoke to one another of what they saw. When I came back from my walk, the woman was waiting at the door for me. I began to wish, when I saw her, that I had never saved her, for here was an end of my privacy. She was very young, at the most nineteen, with a pale, somewhat refined face, yellow hair, merry blue eyes, and shining teeth. Her beauty was of an ethereal type, she looked so white and light and fragile that she might have been the spirit of the storm foam from out of which I plucked her. She had wreathed some of Madge's garments around her in a way which was quaint and not unbecoming. As I strode heavily up the pathway, she put out her hands with a pretty childlike gesture and ran down towards me, meaning, as I surmise, to thank me for having saved her but I put her aside with a wave of my hand and passed her. At this she seemed somewhat hurt, and the tears sprang into her eyes, but she followed me into the sitting-room and watched me wistfully. "'What country do you come from?' I asked her suddenly. She smiled when I spoke, but shook her head. "'Francais?' I asked. "'Deutsch? Espanol?' Each time she shook her head and then she ripped off in a long statement in some tongue of which I could not understand one word. After breakfast was over, however, I got a clue to her nationality. Passing along the beach once more, I saw that in a cleft of the ridge a piece of wood had been jammed. I rowed out to it in my boat and brought it ashore. It was part of the stern post of a boat, and on it, or rather on the piece of wood attached to it, was the word Archangel, painted in strange, quaint lettering. So I thought as I paddled slowly back, this pale damsel is a Russian, a fit subject for the White Tsar, and a proper dweller on the shores of the White Sea. It seemed to me strange that one of her apparent refinement should perform so long a journey in so frail a craft. When I came back into the house, I pronounced the word Archangel several times in different intonations, but she did not appear to recognize it. I shut myself up in the laboratory all the morning, continuing a research which I was making upon the nature of the allotropic forms of carbon and sulfur. When I came out at midday for some food, she was sitting by the table with a needle and thread, mending some rents in her clothes which were now dry. I resented her continued presence, but I could not turn her out on the beach to shift for herself. Presently she presented a new phase of her character. Pointing to herself, and then to the scene of the shipwreck, she held up one finger, 
by which I understood her to be asking whether she was the only one saved. I nodded my head to indicate that she was. On this, she sprang out of the chair with a cry of great joy, and holding the garment which she was mending over her head and swaying it from side to side with the motion of her body, she danced as lightly as a feather all round the room and then out through the open door into the sunshine. As she whirled round, she sang in a plaintive, shrill voice some uncouth, barbarous chant, expressive of exaltation. I called out to her, Come in, you young fiend, come in and be silent. But she went on with her dance. Then she suddenly ran towards me, and catching my hand before I could pluck it away, she kissed it. While we were at dinner, she spied one of my pencils, and taking it up, she wrote the two words, Sophie Ramusen, upon a piece of paper, and then pointed to herself as a sign that that was her name. She handed the pencil to me, evidently expecting that I would be equally communicative, but I put it in my pocket as a sign that I wished to hold no intercourse with her. Every moment of my life now, I regretted the unguarded precipitancy with which I had saved this woman. What was it to me whether she had lived or died? I was no young, hot-headed youth to do such things. It was bad enough to be compelled to have Madge in the house, but she was old and ugly and could be ignored. This one was young and lively, and so fashioned as to divert attention from graver things. Where could I send her, and what could I do with her? If I sent information to Wick, it would mean that officials and others would come to me and pry and peep and chatter. A hateful thought. It was better to endure her presence than that. I soon found that there were fresh troubles in store for me. There is no place safe from the swarming, restless race of which I am a member. In the evening, when the sun was dipping down behind the hills, casting them into dark shadow, but gilding the sands and casting a great glory over the sea, I went, as is my custom, for a stroll along the beach. Sometimes on these occasions I took my book with me. I did so on this night, and stretching myself upon a sand dune, I composed myself to read. As I lay there, I suddenly became aware of a shadow which had interposed itself between the sun and myself. Looking round, I saw to my great surprise a very tall, powerful man who was standing a few yards off, and who, instead of looking at me, was ignoring my existence completely, and was gazing over my head with a stern set face at the bay and the black line of the Mansi Reef. His complexion was dark, with black hair and short, curling beard, a hawk-like nose, and golden earrings in his ears, the general effect being wild and somewhat noble. He wore a faded velveteen jacket, a red flannel shirt, and high sea boots coming halfway up his thighs. I recognized him at a glance as being the same man who had been left on the wreck the night before. Hello, I said in an aggrieved voice. You got ashore all right, then? Yes, he answered in good English. It was no doing of mine. The waves threw me up. I wish to God I had been allowed to drown. There was a slight foreign lisp in his accent, which was rather pleasing. Two good fishermen, who lived round yonder point, pulled me out and cared for me. Yet I could not honestly thank them for it. Ho, ho, thought I. Here is a man of my own kidney. Why do you wish to be drowned? I asked. Because, he cried, throwing out his long arms with a passionate, despairing gesture, there, there in that blue, smiling bay lies my soul, my treasure, everything that I loved and lived for. Well, well, I said, people are ruined every day, but there's no use making a fuss about it. Let me inform you that this ground on which you walk is my ground, and that the sooner you take yourself off it, the better pleased I shall be. One of you is quite trouble enough. One of us, he gasped. Yes, if you could take her off with you, I should be still more grateful. 
He gazed at me for a moment, as if hardly able to realize what I said, and then with a wild cry he ran away from me with prodigious speed and raced along the sands towards my house. Never before or since have I seen a human being run so fast. I followed as rapidly as I could, furious at this threatened invasion, but long before I reached the house he had disappeared through the open door. I heard a great scream from the inside, and as I came nearer, the sound of a man's bass voice speaking rapidly and loudly. When I looked in, the girl, Sophie Rasmussen, was crouching in a corner, cowering away, with fear and loathing expressed on her averted face and in every line of her shrinking form. The other, with his dark eyes flashing and his outstretched hands quivering with emotion, was pouring forth a torrent of passionate, pleading words. He made a step forward to her as I entered, but she writhed still further away and uttered a sharp cry like that of a rabbit when the weasel has him by the throat. Here, I said, pulling him back from her, this is a pretty to-do. What do you mean? Do you think this is a wayside inn or place of public accommodation? Oh, sir, he said, excuse me. This woman is my wife, and I feared that she was drowned. You have brought me back to life. Who are you? I asked roughly. I am a man from Archangel, he said simply, a Russian man. What is your name? Organeff. Organeff? And hers is Sophie Rasmussen? She's no wife of yours. She has no ring. We are man and wife in the sight of heaven, he said solemnly, looking upwards. We are bound by higher laws than those of earth. As he spoke, the girl slipped behind me and caught me by the other hand, pressing it as though beseeching my protection. Give me up my wife, sir, he went on. Let me take her away from here. Look here, you, whatever your name is, I said sternly. I don't want this wench here. I wish I had never seen her. If she died, it would be no grief to me. But as to handing her over to you, when it is clear she fears and hates you, I won't do it. So now, just clear your great body out of this and leave me to my books. I hope I may never look upon your face again. You won't give her up to me, he said hoarsely. I'll see you damned first, I answered. Suppose I take her, he cried, his dark face growing darker. All my tigerish blood flushed up in a moment. I picked up a billet of wood from beside the fireplace. Go, I said in a low voice, go quickly, or I may do you an injury. He looked at me irresolutely for a moment, and then he left the house. He came back again in a moment, however, and stood in the doorway, looking in at us. Have a heed what you do, he said. This woman is mine, and I shall have her. When it comes to blows, a Russian is as good a man as a Scotchman. We shall see that, I cried, springing forward, but he was already gone, and I could see his tall form moving away through the gathering darkness. For a month or more after this, things went smoothly with us. I never spoke to the Russian girl, nor did she ever address me. Sometimes, when I was at work in my laboratory, she would slip inside the door and sit silently there, watching me with her great eyes. At first his intrusion annoyed me, but by degrees, finding that she made no attempt to distract my attention, I suffered her to remain. Encouraged by this concession, she gradually came to move the stool on which she sat nearer and nearer to my table, until after gaining a little every day during some weeks, she at last worked her way right up to me and used to perch herself beside me whenever I worked. In this position, she used, still without ever obtruding her presence in any way, to make herself useful by holding my pens, test tubes, or bottles, and handing me whatever I wanted, with never-failing sagacity. By ignoring the fact of her being a human being, and looking upon her as a useful automatic machine, I accustomed myself to her presence, so far as to miss her on the few occasions when she was not at her post. I have a habit of talking aloud to myself at times when I work, 
so as to fix my results better in my mind. The girl must have had a surprising memory for sounds, for she could always repeat the words which I let fall in this way, without, of course, understanding in the least what they meant. I have often been amused at hearing her discharge a volley of chemical equations and algebraic symbols at old Madge, and then burst into a ringing laugh when the crone would shake her head under the impression, no doubt, that she was being addressed in Russian. She never went more than a few yards from the house, and indeed never put her foot over the threshold without looking carefully out each window in order to be sure that there was nobody about. By this I knew that she suspected that her fellow countryman was still in the neighborhood and feared that he might attempt to carry her off. She did something else which was significant. I had an old revolver with some cartridges which had been thrown away among the rubbish. She found this one day, and at once proceeded to clean it and oil it. She hung it up near the door with the cartridges in a little bag beside it, and whenever I went for a walk she would take it down and insist upon my carrying it with me. In my absence she would always bolt the door. Apart from her apprehensions she seemed fairly happy busying herself in helping Madge when she was not attending upon me. She was wonderfully nimble-fingered and natty in all domestic duties. It was not long before I discovered that her suspicions were well-founded and that this man from Archangel was still lurking in the vicinity. Being restless one night, I rose and peered out of the window. The weather was somewhat cloudy, and I could barely make out the line of the sea and the loom of my boat upon the beach. As I gazed, however, and my eyes became accustomed to the obscurity, I became aware that there was some other dark blur upon the sands, and that in front of my very door, where certainly there had been nothing of the sort the preceding night. As I stood at my diamond-paned lattice, still peering and peeping to make out what this might be, a great bank of clouds rolled slowly away from the face of the moon, and a flood of cold, clear light was poured down upon the silent bay and the long sweep of its desolate shores. Then I saw what this was which haunted my doorstep. It was he, the Russian. He squatted there like a gigantic toad, with his legs doubled under him in strange Mongolian fashion, and his eyes fixed apparently upon the window of the room in which the young girl and the housekeeper slept. The light fell upon his upturned face, and I saw once more the hawk-like grace of his countenance, with the single, deeply indented line of care upon his brow, and the protruding beard which marks the passionate nature. My first impulse was to shoot him as a trespasser, but as I gazed my resentment changed into pity and contempt. Poor fool, I said to myself. Is it then possible that you, whom I have seen looking open-eyed at present death, should have your whole thoughts and ambitions centered upon this wretched slip of a girl? A girl, too, who flies from you and hates you. Most women would love you were it but for that dark face and great handsome body of yours. And yet you must needs hanker after the one in a thousand who will have no traffic with you. As I returned to my bed, I chuckled much to myself over this thought. I knew that my bars were strong and my bolts thick. It mattered little to me whether the strange man spent his night at my door or a hundred leagues off, so long as he were gone by the morning. As I expected when I rose and went out, there was no sign of him, nor had he left any trace of his midnight vigil. End of section 11